Welcome. The Thames River Heritage Park Foundation is pleased to present our first virtual Stories from the Park, Suffragettes, School Teachers, and Socialites, Women of the Thames. I'm Amy Perry, Executive Director of the Foundation, and I want to thank you for joining us. Thames River Heritage Park Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to promote, support, and sustain the Thames River Heritage Park a collection of heritage sites linked by water, which capture the history and, and culture of life along the Thames River. In collaboration with more than 20 heritage and institutional partners, we carry out our mission through educational and historic boat and walking tours by providing water uh, transportation and marketing to our heritage sites, audio tours, which tell the stories of our region, our nation, and the people who came before us, as well as events like this. Today's stories are gonna introduce you to women who have made a significant impact on the educational, economic, cultural, and social fabric of the Thames River communities. From the woman who wrote a book, aiming to keep travelers of color safe in a segregated America, to the female educators who, who restored the opportunity for women to get college degrees in this state, as well as major female philanthropists and many others who stepped up in a variety of ways. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Gail McDonald. Gail is a University of Connecticut journalism professor, author of two local history books, and a featured guide in the park. At the conclusion of Gail's talk, she'll take some questions for a few minutes through the chat feature. So feel free to enter your questions at any time. We hope you enjoy suffragettes, school teachers, and socialites, women of the Thames. Thanks, Amy. And thank you all for, for joining us here today. I wanted to thank the Thames River Heritage Park for allowing me to share uh, some of the stories of these women who helped make history in southeastern Connecticut. I'm going to share my screen now uh, so that you can, I can show you some of their, their faces as we, as we move along. There we go. So 20 was the year anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, uh, for which many women in this country uh, fought for decades to get uh, the vote. Uh, so women were granted universal suffrage in the U.S. in uh, 1920. And it was an appropriate time to start to think about uh, the significance of women in southeastern Connecticut, uh, especially whose stories are not always shared as much as uh, men's stories. Here's a historic postcard of our region, and uh, New London is, um, is at the top, and Groton is at the bottom. And I'm going to be speaking about women in, in a few categories. First of all, women who made important inroads in uh, getting the women's suffrage uh, passed. And uh, philanthropists, there were numerous women philanthropists who came to this area. Um, educators, of course, because uh, education was one of the few career paths that was to women for quite a long time. And finally, some of the, the, some of the stories from some black women who made significant contributions uh, to in Southeastern Connecticut. So we're going to start with the Native Americans and uh, it seems appropriate. They were the first inhabitants of this area and they were in, instrumental in ensuring the survival and preservation of their tribal culture. So I wanted to talk about uh, three important Native American women. So first of all, we'll talk about two 
uh, women who are members of the Mashantucket Pequot tribe, Martha Langevin and Elizabeth George Plouffe. So the, uh, the Pequots, so the whole Thames River area was the domain of the Pequots uh, for, for time immemorial, probably before the what, uh, European colonists came here. And after the 1630s, when the Pequot, Pequots were defeated in the Pequot War, uh, they were granted a reservation, first in Noank and then later inland in what was known as Mashantucket. Uh, through this, the decades and centuries, the, uh, the reservation at Mashantucket was whittled away and uh, much of it was taken from, from the natives. By the early 1800s, there were no more than 40 tribal members already who were still living at Mashantucket, mostly because there was no way to make a living on the reservation. By the mid 1800s, the, uh, the reservation had been reduced from what had been about 1,000 acres to just over 200 acres by various illegal land, land sales. And then jumping ahead another century, in the 1970s, only two elderly sisters were still living on the reservation. And that was these two ladies here. They understood the importance of holding on to the land, uh, to their culture, and, and they knew that if they died without any other tribal members inhabiting the reservation, that uh, the Pequot culture would probably be uh, completely dead in this area. So they, they talked several of their grandchildren into coming back uh, to live on the reservation. And um, they did, and one of those uh, people was Skip Hayward, who along with a, a small band of other Pequots uh, was instrumental in starting several businesses uh, at Mashantucket. And then after the federal um, law change that allowed the tribe to get federal recognition, uh, they established a high stakes bingo hall and later what we now know as Foxwoods Resort uh, Casino. Both Plouffe and Langevin died in the 1970s and they were posthumously inducted into the women's, the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame in 2019. The other tribe that we're very familiar with here in Southeastern Connecticut is the Mohegan tribe. And this lady, Gladys Tantaquidgen, uh, was instrumental in keeping their culture alive. So Gladys uh, was actually born here in New London, and she uh, went to school, public schools here in New London. Uh, she studied traditional medicine most of her life, and she also studied anthropology and native art. She and her brother, Harold, and her father, John, all founded the Tantaquidgen Indian Museum in Uncasville in 1931. By the 1990s, it was her research that was critical in proving the Mohegan tribe's case for federal recognition. Once they were able to get federal, federal recognition, that paved the way for, for that tribe to establish its casino, uh, Mohegan Sun. She died at the age of 106 at Mohegan and is also a member of the Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. While it was the river, the Thames River, that drew native peoples to this area for, for centuries, it also attracted the European settlers here. And it led to New London's prominence um, as a center for naval activities in the American Revolution, for commerce, for trade, in the whaling industry, and a, a, a transportation center. And in the second half of the 19th century, it was the river and the Long Island Sound that drew many wealthy and powerful people here, for, mostly for recreation and for the beauty of the area. While the Gilded Age was an era of excess in a lot of ways, it also was an era of great philanthropy. And some of the wealthy Gilded Age industrialists who made their homes here 
uh, or to our summer homes here, um, also gave generously. And some of those people were women. The first one I wanted to mention was Mary Harkness. Uh, Mary, you may be familiar with uh, uh, the Harkness name because of Harkness State Park. And this is the Harkness's beautiful home, Eolia. Eolia Mansion was actually one of about seven houses that the Harknesses had, but this was said to be one of Mary's favorite homes. She was born in 1872 in July, and she and her husband, Edward, who she married in 1904, always made it a point to be at Eolia for Mary's birthday. The Harknesses were very private people, and so although they were incredibly wealthy and they were great philanthropists, uh, they didn't make a big splash locally, and they were kind of an enigma to the local population. The couple had no children of their own, and Mary dedicated her life to numerous philanthropical pursuits. While her husband was also a philanthropist, it was Mary had many independent interests and uh, she kind of went her own way in giving her money to the causes that she saw fit. So locally, some of the causes that uh, you sh might be familiar with, of course, are is she gave to establish a Harkness Chapel at Connecticut College. And she attended the dedication ceremony there and was said to be asked to speak at that ceremony, but she wasn't very comfortable in the public's eye and she declined. She also uh, gave money that was instrumental in the foundation of what was then known as the Mystic Marine Historical Association, better known to us today as Mystic Seaport. Mary's family actually had deep ties to the Mystic area and she was uh, related to the Greenman family. She also gave to numerous colleges and museums, and probably one of the most prominent of, of, her, uh, of her charities was to establish a Camp Harkness in 1920. At, that, at first, it was dedicated to, to helping children who were afflicted with polio, and now it is, uh, it is for children with developmental disabilities. Well, the Harknesses were uh, established their um, uh, estate on the western shores of the Thames River and Long Island Sound. On the eastern shores, there was another a very prominent philanthropical family, and that was the Plant family. And this was their house uh, that you may recognize. Cranford House, which is still stands on the University of Connecticut campus at Avery Point, was the summer home of Morton Plant. And his second wife, uh, Nellie Plant. Now, unlike the Harknesses, the plants were very comfortable in the public spotlight. And so they made, um, they, were, they were of much interest to the public. The public liked to see what they were doing and they were frequently written up for uh, the parties they gave, and uh, Morton was a great uh, yachtsman, so all of his yachting exploits were written up. But now his second wife, uh, she was uh, very much the Victorian lady, and she took a back seat to her husband, letting him, him be in the spotlight, in the public spotlight most of all. But it really was Nellie who was responsible, first of all, for designing this beautiful house. Uh, she was a, uh, an educated woman. She studied architecture at the Sorbonne in Paris and always had a great interest in it. So in 19... Um, in the early 1900s, 1903, when they were building a, a Bradford house, he was the one who worked with architect Robert Gibson to d design this beautiful house. Here is Nellie aboard uh, one of the plant family's yachts, uh, but she really was not very comfortable on the water. And often Morton would be out um, sailing without her because she did not really 
um, like the water and she actually got seasick apparently. Nellie also, most of all, one of I think her, her most important contributions for us now, um, a century after, after Morton's death, uh, he actually died in the 1918 um, uh, flu pandemic, which we can all relate to um, pretty closely now. Uh, but she was really the one who got him interested in supporting and helping promote the establishment of a women's college here in New London, and that was Connecticut College. There's a lot of evidence that without the prodding and the pushing of Nellie, that uh, Morton may not have been so interested in giving as much time and effort and ultimately money uh, to that cause. But he and, and Nellie uh, gave what was uh, the, the uh, considered the uh, seminal of, uh, donation that established and made a reality, Connecticut College, of $1 million, uh, which was able to get it going. In addition, they gave money to establish two uh, uh, dormitories on campus. And you might recognize, uh, see similarities today uh, in the architecture there of those buildings and with Branford House, because Nellie had a hand in designing those dorms as well. Unfortunately, Nellie died pretty young. Um, the, the wealthy were not immune to the, um, to the, the sicknesses and diseases that plagued everybody at that time. And she died at age 49 in 1913 of typhoid fever at Branford House. And um, uh, Morton actually was out sailing uh, at the time, uh, was entered in a, a big uh, yacht, yachting race. And he retired that boat and never used it again after his second wife's death. Uh, while there's a lot of evidence that Nellie was really um, Morton's kind of the, the love, his true love of his life. Um, it was only 10 months after Nellie's death that Morton married his third and final wife, and that was this lady, Maisie Plant. And she also had these other last names that I have here, uh, Manwaring, Hayward, and Rabensky, because she had quite a few other husbands by the time she died in the 1950s. Unlike Nellie, uh, she was, uh, she loved the limelight. She was uh, 30 years Morton's junior, and she clearly was his trophy wife, and she reveled in that role. She loved uh, to be in the public spotlight, and she liked to um, uh, kind of play along with all the rumors and and different uh, publicity that uh, got her into the papers of that time. Now, but Maisie also, she wasn't just a pretty face. She did, uh, she did uh, use some of her money that she uh, mostly got from uh, her various husbands, but most of the, most of it from Morton Plant, uh, she, she gave to several uh, important causes. And one of them that, uh, that we still know today would be that she gave a substantial amount of money to Lawrence Memorial Hospital. And her, paint, her portrait hangs in the gallery of donors in the hospital. One of the most often told stories about Maisie has to do with the pearls that you see her wearing in this painting. She was uh, 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 caught her eye for, for this string of pearls um, in Cartier's window in New York, where the plants had their townhouse. And she wanted uh, that, um, those pearls. And this was uh, the plant family's uh, townhouse as it looked in 1905 when the plants would have been living there on the left. And on the right is the same building that still exists today. 
because what happened was Mort Morton went back to Cartier's and he had been thinking about moving uptown anyway because this area uh, at Fifth Avenue and 52nd Street was getting um, too commercialized and many of the wealthy people who were living in that area just were slowly moving further uptown. But he decided to propose a deal to Cartier's and that he would get that string of pearls for Maisie and they would get his townhouse. And so he made the swap and, um, and to, to this day, that uh, former townhouse of the plant families remains Cartier's uh, international headquarters in New York City. One of the other houses that Maisie was uh, uh, affiliated with uh, when, with her, her final husband uh, was when they lived in Newport. And you may also uh, recognize the name of that house because she lived at, in Clarendon Court in Newport. That house later became notorious as the home of the Von Bulos and the site of the death of Sonny Von Bulo, who died under mysterious circumstances, which uh, to this day is, has not yet been solved. So moving on from the, uh, the kind of Gilded Age wealth, but another early 20th century woman whose philanthropy uh, was important to this area was this woman, Harriet Upson Allen. And she was born in 1840. She lived in New London all of her life. She was the daughter of an important whaling captain, uh, Lyman Allen. In 1910, Harriet requested that the money from her estate be used to create a park and a museum. And then she also gave a significant chunk of land to Connecticut College. And as we know, the, the um, uh, Lyman Allen Art Museum, which she established in her father's honor, uh, is adjacent to the campus of Connecticut College. Harriet died in 1926, and that it was then that the planning for the museum really got underway. The museum opened in 1932 there were only 13 works of art that it had in its possession at that time. But today, the Lyman Allen Art Museum has 17,000 pieces of art, including paintings, furniture, sculpture, and other important objects of, of art, including a beautiful um, exhibit to Louis Comfort Tiffany, who also uh, played a, a good significant role here in Southeastern Connecticut. So we, we, met, we keep mentioning Connecticut College and certainly Connecticut College has, uh, a, holds a really important place in women's history in Southeastern Connecticut. We talked about um, the plant family and how they gave the money for the college and this, this is how Connecticut College looked when it first uh, was opening. And uh, you can see there was only three buildings there on this kind of forlorn looking piece of property that was in the northern end of the, of the city. So a little bit of background about the college is that, um, is that uh, it, Wesleyan University or Wesleyan College at the time in Middletown had admitted women, but ended that practice in 1909. So after Wesleyan stopped admitting women because men complained about the practice, they, uh, there was uh, no ability for a woman to get a baccalaureate degree in the state of Connecticut. Um, they could go to a teacher's college or they could get a, um, a sort of technical degree from uh, the college that is now the University of Connecticut, but no four-year baccalaureate degree. So a group of people, uh, mostly a college educated women, uh, got together and uh, tried to set up a place where there could be a, a women's college established 
to reestablish this uh, opportunity for young women. And it was quite a, uh, a, uh, a spirited competition uh, as to where to, to locate this new women's college. Ultimately, New London won that honor. And the city raised $135,000 towards establishing the college here, which actually was about $35,000 more than the goal had been. Uh, of the land, uh, most of the land was donated by a local residence. And then uh, Morton Plant, who was the first president of their board of directors, gave the $1 million, which was the pivotal donation, allowing the college to begin operations. The first students arrived at Connecticut College in 1915. And it remained an all-female school until 1969. Uh, and the college also has had numerous notable women faculty members and administrators. Interestingly enough, it wasn't uh, until about uh, 15 or so years after the first students arrived that this very celebrated women's college actually had its first women president. And that was this lady here, uh, Catherine Blunt, she was the Shoe era of the 1940s. And this was a time when Connecticut College underwent a great expansion. There are so many people were that, and that were associated with, with Connecticut College that I could talk about uh, who really made significant contributions. But I picked just a few to mention here. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, there's this woman, Jewel Plummer Cobb. She was a noted cancer researcher and a professor of zoology. And uh, she also served as uh, the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Connecticut College in 1969, uh, which was the year that Connecticut College went co-ed. She was the college's first black teen, dean and she implemented a scholarship program that provided financial assistance to nearly 40 undergraduate students of color and worked to attract more minority women into the sciences. Ruby Turner Morris, who's pictured here with a couple of, of her very stylish students, uh, was an economics professor at Connecticut College she also was a longtime fixture of New London democratic politics. She was the first female mayor of the city in 1974. And she was well known as being outspoken, very colorful and easy to spot in the city as she frequently wore turbans and drove an old bright red Mustang convertible uh, with a plastic flower attached to the antenna. We mentioned that we were going to talk about uh, some, some uh, people who were important to women's suffrage, and this is one of them, Chase Going Woodhouse. She moved to New London in 1934. She was active in the cause for women, women's suffrage, and she came to Connecticut College as an economics professor. She also was the first Democratic woman elected as, the, as Connecticut's Secretary of State in 1940. In addition, she was elected to Congress in 1945. Mary Morrison lived in Groton for 60 years, but she was born in Indiana and educated at Bryn Mawr. She was an early social worker and she worked with Jane Addams to establish Hull House in Chicago, which was the nation's first settlement house. She was a longtime peace advocate and she also was a pioneer in the women's rights movement. She established the Connecticut League of Women Voters and she served on the, as a member of the Board of Trustees for Connecticut College from 1937 until her death in 1971. Although she was not a teacher herself, she worked to improve educational facilities uh, at the college and recreational facilities 
in the town of Groton, and the town of Groton named an elementary school in her honor. There are two other women who are not connected to, oh, and here's a picture of Connecticut College uh, now. Uh, so you can see it looks quite a bit different than those uh, poor three forlorn looking buildings did originally. There are a couple of other women who I wanted to talk about because of their contributions to uh, education. And um, they're not connected to Connecticut College, but they certainly made uh, important inroads here in education. The first one is this lady, Frances Benwaring Calkins. She was born here in New London in 1795 and she was educated in Norwich. She spent a lot of her childhood in New London at her uncle's home, uh, where she loved to use, uh, to read the books that were in his home library. When her stepfather died, she was determined to support herself and assist her mother financially and not do what most women of her time period did, and that was to find a man to support her. She was a teacher herself, and she opened an academy for girls in Norwich Town. She educated about 400 girls over 15 years that she ran the academy. In the mid 19th century, she wrote and published the histories of both New London and Norwich, and those, those are still used today by scholars. And many of her her manuscripts are now in the collection at the New London County Historical Society, which is actually where I'm sitting right now at the Shaw Mansion on Bank Street in New London. Frances also was one of the first women who was asked to join a historical society. And so it was a great honor for her to do that. Finally, for a woman educator from a very different era. And unfortunately, um, I don't have a photograph of her, but I hope to get one uh, soon. And her name was Benny Dover Jackson. She came to New London in 1947 from South Carolina. She was a certified teacher in South Carolina and she had begun her teaching career down there. But when she came to New London and went to get a job here, she was told in no uncertain terms that the city did not hire African-American teachers. She was told that they would consider her for day work or substitute teaching, so she did that. She also uh, needed to get her Connecticut certification. And so she drove back and forth from New London to Eastern, what's now Eastern Connecticut University in Willimantic completed that process. When she was hired in 1950, she was the city's first black substitute teacher. And then she became the, the first full-time black teacher in 1952. She taught elementary school for her career and she was awarded the city's teacher of the year honor in 1971, a year before she retired. The New London's Middle School was named in her honor in 1993. So you may recognize this building as uh, the home of Prudence Crandall in Canterbury. This is now the home of the Prudence Crandall Museum. And you may be familiar with the Prudence Crandall story in which she opened a, a, a school for uh, black girls in the town, in this house, in the town of Canterbury. But I want to tell you the story a little bit about another woman who actually was the woman behind the state heroine, uh, who is Prudence Crandall, and that is Sarah Harris Bayerweather. Because without Sarah, there, uh, Prudence wouldn't have made the heroic a decision that she did to open the school for black girls. Sarah was the first uh, black young lady who went to Prudence and asked to be admitted to her academy. 
because Prudence had a school for, for white girls before um, she opened her other academy. This was in 1832, and Harris was already about 20 years old at this time. She was a member of the daughter of a, of a middle-class uh, black farming family uh, that lived nearby, not far from the center of what's now Canterbury, but at that time was part of Norwood. She wanted to be a teacher. Sarah wanted to be a teacher, and she, she knew that she needed a little bit more education if she was going to pursue that goal. So while Prudence did decide, because Prudence was a Quaker, and they were, uh, for the most part, abolitionists, and uh, she, they, she did open the school for black girls, um, but it was, uh, it was uh, not to, to be a success because the townspeople were not ready for that kind of, of integration of the races in their small rural community community. Uh, Prudence was, was harassed and, um, and attacked. Uh, the school was, was firebombed. The well was poisoned. And she was forced to close the school. Sarah uh, did what uh, so many women of her pe time period did. And she unfortunately did not become a teacher. But in 1833, she married. And she married a man named George Fairweather who uh, was an established blacksmith, which was, was a very important business in those days. This was the, the whaling era and a blacksmith was really needed um, besides all the, uh, the horses and, and wagons, buggy parts that uh, blacksmith made. So in 1834, actually their first child was born on the same night the school was attacked. The Fairweathers moved to New London, and they lived in New London um, for, for 14 years. And George purchased a blacksmith shop here in New London. And they were very active abolitionists. And they had regular contact with some of the most uh, well-known, noted abolitionists of the day, including uh, William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, who did speak in New London. Uh, so they probably had, uh, they, you know, direct contact with Frederick Douglass. They, they were um, active in the movement for racial equality in other ways, and she, she and her husband were believed to be conductors on the Underground Railroad. George was um, a half Narragansett Indian, and the couple did move to Kingston, Rhode Island after living for about 14 years in New London. And they, he continued his blacksmith trade over there. Um, the University of Rhode Island has recognized the Fairweathers and a dormitory is actually named for Sarah Harris. While Sarah never became a teacher herself, uh, one of her sisters, and her daughter and her son all became teachers. And there she is at, in her older years. Actually, if you go online and Google her name, you can find a picture of her from when she was a very young woman. She was uh, quite, quite beautiful. While Sarah Harris fought for equal opportunity for, for black residents, uh, uh, later, another New London woman worked to ensure black travelers' safety. And that was this woman, um, who's uh, not a great picture, but the only one that um, is uh, readily available of her, uh, Sadie Dillon Harrison. You might be familiar with a book called The Negro Motorist Green Book. There was actually a movie a few years ago made uh, called Green Book. And the Green Book was designed to keep uh, black travelers safe in a, in a segregated America. And it, things were segregated, not just in the South, it was up here as well. But six years before the Green Book was published, uh, Sadie 
co-wrote an earlier guide with the same purpose, and it was called Hackley and Harrison's Hotel and Apartment Guide for Colored Travelers. The guidebook listed 300 uh, listed accommodations in 300 U.S. cities, including New London. Uh, among the houses that were listed as being safe for Black travelers in New London was the Crocker House and the Mohegan Hotel, although both were also noted as being owned by whites. Harrison's own home, which was located at 73 Hempstead Street here in New London, still stands and was another house that was listed in her own guide. She actually had, been, had received a letter from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who is a noted uh, sociologist, writer, and uh, somebody who was active for Black working for Black rights. And he was coming to New London. He had been invited to the city to um, speak and confer with a group who was looking to establish a bank for African Americans who would serve African Americans and which was established on Green Street in the city. And he had written to Sadie Harrison asking whether she knew of a place where he could safely stay while he was in the city. So we're not quite sure whether that was um, one of the reasons why she opened her own home, or uh, but she was had already been working on this book at the time. Another listing in, in Harrison's Guide was this building that you might recognize on Bank Street in uh, in London, number eighty eight Bank Street. It was it was then called the Gertrude. It's now uh, the home of a fair trade store called Flavors of Life. This, this building also is notable for another reason, uh, again, an earlier era in which it is also believed to be, have been a stop on the Underground Railroad. These are just a few of the of stories of important women of our area. There are many more. And I thank you for, for allowing me to share these stories. And I, I hope, I encourage you to also, um, you know, come and take one of the Thames River Heritage Parks tours in the summer on the water taxi or as a walking tour. Uh, one of them, which also deals with our women's history, I'm able to talk about many more women uh, who were significant to this area. And I wanted to just close with this word from Myra Pollock Sadker, who was a pioneer in uh, proving that uh, 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 of the um, disconnect between uh, in education that girls did not were not uh, given the same um, notice, especially in history. Each time a girl opens a book and reads a womanless history, she learns she is worthless. And we know that that applies to so many other groups of people as well. So I'm hoping that by telling these stories and making them come alive again, that um, we can do our part to, to end uh, that kind of feeling among, for young girls and women. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to, I think I have time to, an yep, I do, um, answer a few questions and see if there are any in the chat. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And, Okay, let's see. Um, one thing I should mention, I, I think that some people, I did mention that I'm here in the Shaw Mansion, so I see that somebody had asked me a question about uh, women from an earlier era in, of the, the 18th century, uh, to be specific, and certainly, there's uh, portraits of, of a couple of, of great uh, ladies that should be mentioned. Uh, and one of whom, I know you can't see her paint her portrait very good, 
But Lucretia Shaw, who uh, played a, a big role during the American Revolution, she was the wife of uh, Nathaniel Shaw Jr., who was uh, the head of, of uh, privateering um, for the Continental uh, Army. And uh, you know, George Washington and other really uh, notable people of the day uh, came frequently to uh, confer with Nathaniel Shaw, Lucretia, who was um, very young and already a widow with, with some children when she married Nathaniel, uh, was a, a wonderful hostess here uh, to some of the most notable people of her era. Uh, and she decided to uh, open this house as a kind of hospital for for sick sailors and soldiers uh, during the revolution at that from whom she unfortunately uh, caught a fever and died in 1781. Uh, yes, I mean, we, there were also Anna Warner Bailey uh, across the river uh, in Groton, a very significant to the American Revolution. Um, I see another question here. Um, from Adria, uh, do you have any research on Abby Slocum of Groton? I, I, you know, I'm sorry. I actually, this is uh, this is the first I've heard of Abby, and but I would love to know more. Um, oh, the adoption of the Connecticut flag. Yes, I did hear about that story, um, but I don't know much about her. So I'm going to have to. Uh, look up some some information about her and maybe incorporate her into uh, one of my tours for the summer. Any other questions that anybody has? Another really interesting story was that one of the Amistad mutineers was a uh, uh, actually a child of a female child was among the mutineers aboard the Amistad. And of course, the Amistad, uh, New London was the first place that the Amistad uh, touched land and the first place that the mutineers came uh, onto American soil. And that little girl was actually um, uh, one, uh, uh, sent, she went back to uh, West Africa much later and uh, but she was the only one of the Amistad mutineers who actually returned to the U.S. after going back to Africa. And she came back to the U.S. to be educated um, to go to college here in the U.S. So uh, that's another really interesting story that is uh, connected to New London. So I am not seeing any other questions. Uh, I've, I'm going to turn this back over to Amy. And again, uh, I encourage you to, to, uh, to find us again in the summer and, um, and come uh, sail on the water taxi with us and, and hear some tours or, or walk around New London or Groton and uh, get some, uh, some history that way. But thank you all for coming today. Thank you, Gail. Um, I know that there are a couple questions that you might not have seen, so you might want to look in the chat and maybe answer them. They were actually very good questions. Um, so I want to thank everyone for their time, for their questions, and for their support of the park. Um, we plan to post a recording of this probably sometime next week. And lastly, um, a friendly reminder that although water taxi season doesn't open until Memorial Day, uh, you can buy taxi tickets, tour tickets, season passes, make donations at any time during the year at thamesriverheritagepark.org. Um, so we hope you'll uh, take a look. Everything you want to know about the park will be on our site. Um, and we hope we'll see you again soon um, when we put together another virtual stories from the park. So, so long. So uh, I, I do see the, the other uh, questions now, Amy. I'm sorry, I missed them earlier. But I, saw, I see a question here about 
asking whether the whether men of these various eras uh, were supportive of these women. And that's a, an interesting question, and I'm not sure I can really adequately answer it. I think that um, trailblazers always uh, faced challenges, uh, whether they were female, black, uh, Hispanic, uh, um, immigrants, um, it doesn't matter. Um, so I, I know that um, with some of these folks, they certainly were supported by uh, the men who were around them. I mean, um, the Plant family, for example, uh, supported, Morton supported Nellie's efforts. Um, but still it was, you know, it was of that era. I mean, she was still in the background. So yes, there was support, but not really the kind that maybe we would we would like to think of of now. Um, I also see a question here about information about um, Jewish and Hispanic women. I, I'm always looking to include a wide diversity of of types of women in the tours that I give, and um, while nobody is like specifically jumping to my mind right now. I, I'm always looking for these stories. And so I would um, welcome anybody to share um, anything that they know of with me, which would be great. I mean, there really are a ton of other stories out there um, that I know of too, that I, you know, just, we just don't have time. Um, in the in the hour that we we had here together, so let me just take a quick look and see. I think that that pretty much addresses everything I'm seeing. So again, thank you.